Should the king make time to see Harry? Why are the government being so secretive about Prince Andrew? And how will the family mark the anniversary of the death of the queen? We'll be tackling all those questions and more. Yes, we are back. Welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Joe Elvin, and here to discuss the week's big royal stories are the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, and the paper's diary editor, Richard Eden. A big welcome back to the Dream Team. And a reminder that if you like royal videos featuring the finest experts, make sure you subscribe to our channel and never miss another episode of Palace Confidential. Well, it's been a while, so we've got so much to talk about, and we'll get to Harry's visit to the UK in just a moment. But let's start with the poignant anniversary of the death of Queen Elizabeth II, which was unbelievably one year ago this week. Rebecca, that year has flown by. It's hard what? to believe, isn't it? I had to pinch myself when I realised. It's just incredible. Do you have any insight into how the family might be marking the anniversary tomorrow? I do. There's not too much I can discuss at the moment because a lot, a lot of this is embargoed on the day. But I, I think it's fair to say their plans have changed. I think before it was going to be very low key and they and they didn't really want to to make a kind of song and dance of the occasion because obviously you know it's a very sad well, person it's not a celebration for is them. It? Yeah, yeah exactly um, but there's definitely been a, a sea change in that attitude so we will see members of the royal family um, marking it more publicly um, uh, mostly tomorrow um, on the actual day itself but even then it'll still it'll still be limited because obviously it's a, it's a day whereas uh, you know the king has made clear he'd like to be alone with his with his own thoughts as well yes now the thing is with Queen Elizabeth with uh, the anniversary of the passing of her father it was always very quiet very introspective very private but I, I sort of sense that the public might want more from and I, the family. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Joe. And I think that's what's prompted this change is that I think people, you know, it's reminded them of, you know, a very sad time in, in, in national life, but also happy memories because she left an incredible legacy of her, of her 70 years on the throne. So I think people have mixed emotions and they want to mark it. And I think the royal family feel they need to be seen to be leading that and responding to it. Yeah, indeed, Richard, you know, it's one of those, what do you remember where you were on the day? And I was with you. <laughs> what are your memories from that very strange day last year? Yeah, it's one of those days that I think genuinely I'll never forget. Um, I mean, I'm sort of becoming a bit sad remembering that day. It was, it was just, it was a strange day because there was so much sort of different information we were receiving and it was it was a question of trying to find out what was true, what were rumours. We really didn't know what to believe. I mean, obviously you'll remember it was a Thursday, so we were due yes. to record Palace Confidential. So the question was, you know, what on earth will we include? And then shortly before we were due to go on air, um, the Palace issued that statement where they said that the Queen's doctors were concerned about her health. and. You know, anyone who follows these things will know that palace statements are so um, under, understated yes. always. So when they actually said they were concerned, we thought, oh my goodness, it really is cause for concern. Mm. So we went ahead, we did a program, it was just me and you discussing because Rebecca was so busy trying to find out the facts. And, and it just became, it wasn't until later in the day we had the confirmation of the Queen's death and then everything changed. It just became a a race to get that paper out and a, a special tribute edition. Uh, yes, it's interesting, isn't it, because it's an incredibly sad day, but dare I say it, when you're a journalist and it's such an historic day, it's what were your memories? There's, there's an adrenaline there as well, isn't there? Yeah, and it and it had been a kind of slow build up to that point because I'd received on the Tuesday a call from a very good contact who said, look, this may sound really strange, Rebecca, but I don't think Her Majesty is ever coming back to Windsor which is obviously a very bold statement to make and it was more there was just there was rumors going around there was a feeling that things were changing people who would normally expect it to come into work weren't um, but then we saw the pictures of her meeting um, uh, the new prime minister and while she did look very frail and there were you know obviously marks on the back of her hand which indicated maybe she received some sort of treatment she was still there working so it was like it, it was very difficult to run a story on that basis mm. but then 
we heard very early on the Thursday that she'd taken a very serious turn for the worse, so serious that it was almost like something catastrophic had happened. So as Richard said, it was a real battle that day um, to stand up the information. I mean, it's fair to say by kind of lunchtime, myself and other people in the newsroom had a good idea that we were hours away. So you just, you do have to put your work hat on and get into, you know, getting that paper out. And as Richard rightly says, you know, the Daily Mail giving the best possible tribute to the most incredible monarch most of us will ever experience. But equally, when, when that statement came out, um, I remember our chief reporter looking at me as I was writing and said, are you crying? <laughs> and I did, like, I did have tears coming down my face because it was... As I was as I was writing, because it really was, she was such an incredible woman with such an incredible legacy, and been fortunate enough in my position to actually have had personal dealings with her. You can't help but feel it personally as well. I would say. And I don't know if you'll be able to answer this or not, but in the year that's followed, have you had much indication of Charles's journey through that? Have you ever had any words with him about how he's felt about? this first year without? I mean, I did briefly say to him, you know, I'm so sorry at your loss. In fact, that was, that was really a remarkable moment. So I was the reporter outside Buckingham Palace when their majesties, as in their new majesties, came back to Buckingham Palace for the first time from Scotland. And it, it was very raw and it, it was tried, very difficult to get through the crowds. I literally had to climb over people's shoulders to get to my position uh, at the front of the palace where I should have been. And suddenly you heard, it, it was kind of, there was a real quiet and suddenly you could hear this kind of echo of God save the king moving up from the moor getting closer and closer. Mm. And I still get shivers down wow. my spine thinking about it now. It was a really, a moving historical moment and they got out of the car and obviously they weren't sure what the reaction of the crowds would be because you know the, I mean, everyone was grieving and you could see the king almost kind of steal himself and right right I'm gonna get into work mode but I certainly know with Queen Camilla I mean she had tears in her eyes she was barely holding it together she was so moved by what she saw and I did as I say then I said to him very briefly and you know, I'm really sorry for your loss and he kind of smiled and said thank you and but I mean for him it's he wasn't really allowed to grieve in public. Yeah. He just had to get on with his new role, and that's very difficult. I suspect this anniversary, in some ways, might be harder for him than than a year ago, because at that point, like, like us, the instinct to just get the paper out was taking over. For him, it was just all the the job of becoming the king was what took yeah. over. And so now I suspect he's got time to reflect and it will probably be a sadder moment. Yeah, although I, mean, I haven't had a chance to talk about it here, but there was just before I went off for the summer break, I wrote a big feature for the, for the Mail about Balmoral and the changes there were going to be up there over this summer. It was going to be the same but different. And a very, very well-placed source, I, I talked to them about what it was like being up there or being part of that in, in September last year. And they said to me, although there was a lot of talk about the Queen's death, her demise was actually very quick and it really did take them on the hop. No one expected it to happen that day and that week. I think they thought it would be in the next six months, but, but not then. And although you can prepare a lot for these things, and obviously the, you know, the bridges and Golden Orb and Spring Tide, all those various operations have been in planning for years. They said, there's only so much you can do. Yeah. And um, they described it as kind of basic, like kind of having to learn to fly the plane while you were doing it, um, because a lot of things, you know, had to go, you know, be thrown out. A lot of new things had to be brought in. So they said it was a really, you know, uh, really adrenaline fueled ride for them at the time as well. The only, the main thing I remember is being dispatched to go and get some different clothes because the producer noted that I had some very cheery day glow orange <laughs> trousers on and that might not suit the mood that was about to come. But we'll move on. Well, it, you know, it's, it, it's a problem for all yeah. sorts, isn't it? But uh, we will be looking back more on the reign of Her Majesty the Queen in our montage a little later on in the show. I think you're going to really like it. Rebecca, moving on. Uh, a royal historian who is writing a book about... Prince Andrew, 
has come unstuck in his request for government documents, apparently. What, what do we know about this? So this author, Andrew Lowney, claims that he has been told that uh, he's put in a, what we call a freedom of information request, which means you can ask to see official, official government correspondence regarding certain things. Um, the royal family are actually not normally included in that. They're exempt from FOI requests, which obviously is quite frustrating for people like me who are journalists and want to find out things. Um, but obviously Andrew had a role that gave him direct uh, links with the government when he was a, a UK special ambassador for trade. Mm. So I think we're trying to, they're trying to get some information via that route. And basically he says he's been told that those papers won't be released until 2065. Uh, which obviously is an all through fact. And we will be discussing that in 2065 in Palace Confidential, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll see we'll you there. We'll be sitting here in our little Zimmer frames, yeah. won't we? And yeah. <laughs> but what do you make of this, Richard? I think obviously we don't know the truth of this, and but with any secrecy or suppose there becomes speculation, and Prince Andrew doesn't really need any more of that innuendo, does he? No, I mean, I'm a bit skeptical about some of these claims. Andrew Lowney is an author who's trying to generate publicity for his book. He's also a literary agent, I think. Um, so I think the truth is it remains to be seen whether it would be till 2065 or not. But certainly he says that's what he's been told. But I'm sure Prince Andrew, you know, has got nothing to hide. He would like things to be released. Um, we already had some details. Do you remember they came out in that leak of documents? It was a, uh, there was lots of details about Prince Andrew when he was um, trade envoy and um, various. It was pretty unflattering most of it. Mm. Um, but I, I think from. Prince Andrew's point of view, the um, more clarity there is, the better. He, he would argue he doesn't have anything to hide. He's always very keen to clear his name, and you know, it might do him some good if um, these details came out sooner rather than later. But didn't one official say on that that um, he was he found him really pompous and how he really aggravated everybody who came in and insisted on... It's not the on, first time we've heard those kind no, of descriptions exactly. around our Andrew, is it? And insisted on having one of his valets bring his own ironing board with him rather than using one provided by the embassy or the hotel because it was the only way to iron his Well, clothes. come on, it's useful to have your own ironing board, you know. <laughs> I never travel without mine. <laughs> I was yeah. about to say, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you have your personal valet <laughs> pressing your clothes before you come on the telly, Richard. If only. Don't but it, but give it, him any it, ideas. It, it's not, yeah, it's not very edifying, is it? So. No. Well, and, and speaking of that, you know, we don't often discuss our Peter Phillips on the show, the son of Princess Anne, but Rebecca, he has plans for a royal, a right royal ice rink. Yeah, this. <laughs> <laughs> They're, they're, we, we've been at this situation before, I have to say. So obviously, have we? Because it's quite random. Yeah. Well, in terms of Peter Phillips coming up with a business proposition that involves either a member of the royal family or a royal residence, um, he uh, came up with the patrons' lunch, uh, which he got his grandmother very much involved with, and there was a lot of scandal around that. Because didn't he flog milk in China? Yeah, he yeah. flogged milk in China. Yeah. But there was a lot of scandal about this patrons' lunch because it was meant to raise money for charities the Queen's involved in, with it they got I mean a fraction of it and it earned out that he'd earned you know tens if not hundreds of thousands of pounds out of it so yes we we, we learned through um, an interview uh, a very anodyne and very carefully controlled interview with Hello magazine um, yesterday that he had come up with the idea to install an ice rink at Kensington Palace for this winter these things are actually very popular makes delightful sense. delightful with lots of food Food and, and you know drink stands and uh, funny enough the palace said yes please do so <laughs> and do you think this might raise eyebrows Richard is this something that's going to put another few hundred thousand into Peter's pockets <laughs> look there, there will be criticism I'm sure I mean there'll be lots of other companies events organizers who would love to have had the opportunity to to bid um, to host it, I'm sure. Um, but the thing is, um, Peter Phillips has organised previous events. As you said, he's got um, he's got a long history of of doing this type of thing. So, you know, he's ideally placed, and presumably King Charles trusts his nephew. He knows he's not going to um, cause problems. And personally, I'll definitely go. I mean, it's going to be wonderful, isn't it? You know, ice skate with the backdrop of Kensington Palace. We should broadcast from it. I need to learn to ice skate. <laughs> I can't do it. You know, it. Prince William and Catherine can come with the, the yeah. children, you know. So um, we've got a history in London of having these ice rinks in tourist spots at Somerset House or outside yeah. Natural History Museum. And they're, they're great. I mean, it's hard to think of them now. Look, we're on a, you know, 
boiling hot day here in September, but yeah. by um, December, you know, it's something that we'll look forward to. So good luck to him, really. Yeah, I wonder how much emission he'll be charging. Well, I don't know, but there, I, there's some talk of a VIP stand that costs something like five thousand pounds to hire. So we'll make sure we some... get entry into that, then, Rebecca. I do think we Palace need to. Palace Confidential do... can pay for that. Palace Confidential <laughs> no on ice. Yeah. I mean, oh I, gosh. I, I think it's <laughs> amazing. But we'll Let's be there it. by the size, like holding on to one of those children's yeah. penguins, trying to stand up. So I'm not sure. Get your muffs fluffed successful. and ready. Can't wait. Um, now let's let's move on to Harry now, Rebecca. And by the time this show goes out. He'll be among us. He'll be here in the UK. Um, but as your colleague Kate Mersey wrote on Sunday, the Mail on Sunday, the King apparently has no time in his diary <laughs> to see his son. No, and actually, I don't think Harry's planned it. That he has much time in his diary to see him. So I think that probably tells you all you need to know about the state of family relationships. But yes, he is um, coming over as patron of Wellchild, which is an amazing charity that does incredible work for seriously and terminally ill children and their mm. families. And I've covered that event so many times over the years. Um, uh, it is amazing. He's coming over to meet the families and to, to give them awards. But again, it's interesting that he is pretty much flying this straight in and flying then pretty much straight out to the Invictus Games in uh, in Germany at the weekend. Mm. Now, Richard, I probably don't actually need to ask this question, but it's written here, so I will. <laughs> but it's, do you think that it seems like the King should make time for Harry in his diary? Because over the last couple of weeks, I've, I've seen so many people say, oh, you know, of course the King should, you know, um, proffer another olive branch towards Harry and he should be meeting him, he should be inviting him to Balmoral, all this type of thing. But I just think, look, remember what happened a year ago. You know, if, if one of our grandparents was, was ailing, you know, you'd want to make their life as pleasant and as easy as possible. Remember what happened. You know, while Prince Philip was literally dying in hospital, um, they went ahead with the interview with Oprah Winfrey, where, which just caused so much anguish and mm. anger and then obviously he died soon afterwards and then you know while the queen was very frail increasingly poor health they you know they announced that he was going to be having his tell-all memoir they're going to be doing the netflix series i mean you know it almost seemed like calculated to cause them anguish so the, the idea that king charles while he's all his thoughts are about his his parents and particularly his his mother should think oh i've got to see my son who caused all that trouble i i just think it's a appalling idea, frankly. I think it's a really good point, actually, Richard. Yeah. And I think also, you know, the focus should be on remembering Queen Elizabeth and her legacy, not not the family drama. And um, I, I mean, imagine it... if he invited Harry to Balmoral tomorrow, yeah. then the headlines would all be about, you know, the King's meeting with Harry, and they wouldn't be focusing on, um, you know, remembrance of Queen Elizabeth. Yeah, knowing the palace mindset as I do, I, I just think they will think this is the wrong time. It, you know, it may be in, you know, a few weeks or a few months, they might consider it, but, you know, it's definitely not the right time to do it now. You're absolutely no. right. Mm, well. Well, we will have more on Harry's visit to the UK and Europe and the big new plans in just a moment, but let's hear a couple of your comments first. After our recent Summer Roundup episodes, Anne wrote, thank you for this look back. I'm thinking of King Charles and his close family at Balmoral this year, wishing them a peaceful time of reflection. Very sweet indeed. And meanwhile, Abacus was moved to write after a recent montage was a lovely roundup of photos from the year so far and a reminder of just how busy King Charles and Queen Camilla have been. Supported by the Prince and Princess of Wales, the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh and the Princess Royal, their enthusiasm matches their many years of experience and they can still wow with the glamour and tiaras. Despite the many shenanigans elsewhere, it's always a great word, the senior royals have continued doing what they do best, representing and serving the people of the UK and the Commonwealth. Long may they continue. Thank you for the abacus. Make sure you check out today's montage later in the show. Well, let's go back to the panel with a couple of mysterious elements to this week's European visit by Harry. Rebecca, is it even clear where he will stay when he's in the UK? No, it's not. No idea. No one's told you. Cards on the table. Mm. No idea. He, he could go to Frogmore still. It's not his home anymore, but Eugenie's there. So he could go and stay with her at Frogmore. I think one news outlet reported yesterday they thought he would be staying at a hotel near where the awards are um, in Lancaster Gate. Uh, but we don't know. And that's actually, in a way, part of the story because, of course, he 
now has a rootless existence when he comes to UK because he has no permanent base here anymore. Mm. I did see, by the way, some some you know stories kind of making it sound like there was a negative spin that he wasn't staying at Buckingham Palace. No one's at Buckingham Palace at the moment because it's open to the public. Um, so you couldn't really have a member of the royal family staying there. No one's at Windsor because obviously the king and the queen are up in, uh, in, in Scotland. So there's not really a royal residence he could stay at that would enable him to facilitate this really short visit to London. Mm. But, it, but it does show you the fact that he is so far out of the royal family now, there's no, nowhere obvious for him to live. Maybe he's airbnb -ing it. We mm. just don't know. Soho House. Yeah, probably. <laughs> now, Richard, in today's paper, there were question marks raised over Meghan's involvement in Harry's big Invictus event. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, this was really confusing because um, initially Meghan was in the schedule for the Invictus game. She was going to have a role. I think it was about talking about the competitors, and it was, you know, it was formally announced in the schedule. But then, in the sort of latest edition, um, she's been dropped and replaced by someone else. I think the organisers have said it was an oversight, it was a mistake, and she shouldn't have been in there originally. But obviously, that's got people thinking: Well, is she coming or not? What role is she going to have? I must say, though, with Harry and Meghan, you do always tend to sort of get this, well, they won't, they? I don't, yeah. They do seem to like this, because it gets people talking about, you know, what they're going to be doing. Um, but she'll definitely... We saw um, Meghan um, accompany Harry when the Invictus Games were in the Netherlands, in The Hague. She went to that, and I'm sure she'll be there um, in Dusseldorf as well. Um, but what, what element she has in the ceremony or whatever, who, who knows, we'll mm. see. We'll have to wait and see. Now, Rebecca, we had a special show last week, otherwise we would have discussed this last week, but Harry's Invictus documentary, it, it wasn't without controversy, was it? There's particular, there were comments he made about a lack of family support when he returned from his um, army duties in Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean, he didn't specifically say the word family, but he made very clear there was no personal or professional support network around him when he came back, which is obviously massively at odds with what he said in previous interviews, was when he came back, his own brother, Prince William, from now, he's now estranged from, uh, could see that his brother was unravelling and actually yeah. said, I really think you need to seek professional help for, for mental health issues and support. And Harry praised his brother for being a huge um, well of support for him. So I think there was a lot of pointing out of the fact that there was this, you know, dichotomy in what, in what he was saying. And I also think it's a shame for Invictus because, you know, I've covered several Invictus games personally. I was with Harry in the States where he went and saw the Warrior Games and said, I remember him so distinctly saying, to me and a couple of others, you know, I want to replicate this in the UK, I want to bring this back. And I remember thinking at the time, oh God, yada, 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 will this ever, ever happen? And I happily admit I was wrong. He did help to successfully bring it. And it has changed so many people's lives for the better. So why not just focus on that? Why does he always need to get a bit of a dig in? Yeah. And I just think if he had... PR advisors around him because let's not forget this isn't an Archwell production it's not him being stitched up by, by some awful journalist that's trying to catch him on the hop he has chosen to say this on film and for it to be kept in the documentary and I just think if he had PR advisors around him who were sharp to this and really had his best interests at heart they would dissuade him from doing this and let the focus be on the competitors. What do you make of it Richard? Why do you think there is that well clear discrepancy? Um, I mean I've watched the series and it's a great series I'd recommend it you know, lots of you know really interesting moving stories about the competitors because you know each one at the Invictus Games does have an interesting story to tell but there was something slightly distasteful about Harry's complaints because you know you had next to the story of someone that had lost both their legs or you know had almost been killed by a bomb then you had Prince Harry who wasn't injured in, in Afghanistan um, then kind of moaning about a lack of support for himself when as we all know he's surrounded by support by aids and this type of thing people to help him and it, that that's what what jarred mm. um for me and i think sort of slightly probably let down the series now sorry to say this but i think the series actually might have done better with a, a different presenter you know i know that they think oh great it's prince harry and everything but you know it could to have someone neutral a good presenter 
um, telling these stories could have actually been more effective, I think. It hasn't been very successful, has it? It's not actually made the top ten in any really? country around the world. Well, I mean, it's a serious program, mm. so I think you'd always expect mm. the entertainments and the dramas on Netflix to be more popular. So, you know, I wouldn't necessarily see that um, as a criticism, but, you know, they, they like to do kind of serious documentaries as well. So I think it succeeded on that level. Yeah, but, it's a tough subject. Um, yeah. But I guess at least he got it made, no? Yeah. With his um, celebrity. Yeah, they produced mm. something. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. uh, now, Rebecca, speaking of productions, um, Megan's commercial plans have come into view. The supposedly big project in the offing. Yeah, it's quite interesting because I think they're trying to start a bit of a fight back against what they see as the negative coverage of what they've been doing. Um, and there was a very carefully timed, and I would suggest carefully placed, piece in one of the papers at the weekend that is broadly very sympathetic to the Sussexes, uh, talking about how this is their big moment. Um, and in it that they said that uh, Meghan had plans for a big new project of her own that would be authentic to who she is. So I will leave our viewers to decide what on earth that could be. And it was a major commercial project they yes, made clear. Exactly, what, what does yeah. that mean? What? Authentic. <laughs> yeah. The mind boggles, Well, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've certainly, there were certainly lots of suggestions online when I um, mentioned this <laughs> story, so I think we wait with bated breath. Yes, we do indeed. Now, we've seen a big publicity push from them, Richard, as, as we say, but the message really does seem to be get out there, make a splash. God, it's been a bit weird, hasn't it? I feel like I've kind of been bombarded with Harry and Meghan over the past week. I mean, look, for all I know, she might be Beyonce's biggest fan, but she went to two out of her three... It, it didn't look like <laughs> Harry was, did it? <laughs> no. He but, looked like but, he would have rather have been anywhere else. But Meghan went to two out of three of Beyonce's concerts in L.A., and I've read articles, I've seen people saying, oh, you know, this really shows that she's made it in Hollywood now because she's, you know, photographed smiling with, you know, stars like Kelly Rowland and, um, was it Ke Kerry Washington, I think, the actress. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, people like that, which to me is just weird because surely it shows that she's trying to sort of reflect in others' um, glory rather than herself. I mean, let's I don't know, maybe they're just her friends. Mm, yeah, I mean, let's look back. Don't be so cynical. <laughs> let's look back. When she attended um, the, it was a premiere in London of um, the, I think it was the live action version of The Lion King. You know, we had Beyonce and Jay-Z there lined up to meet the royal couple. You know, that, that was when they were still royal, so mm. to speak. And now we've got her sort of trying to sort of cling on to other people in a, in a bid to get in the papers. I, just seems quite unedifying and not really what royalty is. So, do, do you agree with that, Rebecca? Well, they're not royalty anymore, yeah. and I and I get it that in Hollywood it is about being seen and and who you're being seen with. And I mean, there was a really fascinating picture of of the second concert she went to, and it, standing in a line which of people included people like you know Jeff Bezos and standing next to the boss of Netflix. Clearly, I think I suspect it was him that who invited her. Um, and I think that does mean something in Hollywood. I mean, it's not a world I understand, but it does mean something. Whether that will translate into something, you know, concrete or meaningful or that will earn the money, I think is another another question. Well, and speaking of that, this whatever this commercial venture is, this new venture, it's a big test, isn't it? It's a real, it feels like a proper make or break. Yes, because we have seen her, you know, very publicly invest in that kind of vegan mushroom coffee brand, but we kind of, there was a flurry about it when she sent a basket to Oprah and Oprah very helpfully went, oh look, this is from my friend Megan. I think this has got to be but bigger then... than vegan mushrooms, <laughs> Rebecca, if it's a major commercial Everybody's venture. Everybody's crazy about <laughs> vegan mushroom coffee. But, but, then yeah. we've ne but that's the thing, we've, ne we've not actually heard about it, and you know, Harry, um, took on this chief impact officer role with Better Up, which is a kind of online kind of coaching and, and mental health firm. And, and yet we see saw stories over the summer that they're having to lay off staff. And there was a really critical piece saying, you know, what impact has he brought to this company? Nothing. Um, others were saying, look, no one would probably know about Better Up if it wasn't for him. So maybe he has had some impact. But there's nothing that's really 100% worked for them yet, apart from the, the documentaries and the mm. books 
basically having a go at the rest of the royal family. And there was in the same piece, Richard, quite a strong quote saying that the pair are quote unquote done with their former lives and they acknowledge that his family don't want to see him. I mean, remember during the publicity tour, um, you know, when he was giving, Prince Harry was giving interviews on TV, it was all about his demands. He was saying, you know, I'm only going to come to the coronation if I get this. I want an apology. I want a, a sit down meeting. None of that happened. None of that whatsoever. I mean, he still came briefly for the coronation. But I think it's just a realization that what he wanted, what they wanted, hasn't happened. I mean, uh, let's face it, now Meghan is estranged from. Harry's family in the same way that she's estranged from her own father and pretty much all of her own family apart from her mother. Mm. So I think it's, it's actually it's very sad, sad for them. They're missing out on a huge amount of, um, you know, being friends and having that relationship with the rest of the family. So I think it, it is genuinely a sad family thing. Mm. I was really shocked actually at some of that because Maybe I shouldn't have, shouldn't have been, but there was a comment in again in one of the favourable publications that had clearly been pushed or leaked by you know Team Sussex saying this is an end to their look back projects. This is only going to be look forward from now on, and it just struck me as a really arrogant statement. Like, okay, we've we, we're now done dissing you. We're now going to move on. Like. Who necessarily gives them the right to do that? I, I, I was really Mark my quite words, shocked. they'll be looking back again. <laughs> yeah, it does feel that way, doesn't it? Yeah, I just, yeah. I just found it very, very strident. And again, you know, if people are trying to think they're doing, the, doing good PR for them on this basis, I, I don't think they are. Mm. Gosh, well, so that, you have to wonder what the Queen would think of it all, don't you? Mm. But anyway, with that, and speaking of the Queen Anne montage this week features a picture from every year of the reign of Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. Really hope you enjoy it. A reminder there of the extraordinary reign of the late Queen. For more great royal content like that and like this show, make sure you press the subscribe button below. Just time to say thank you to Rebecca and Richard and to you, of course, for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.